After the Arab conquest, which occurred in the 7th century, a new religion, language, government, and culture was introduced to Iran, then Persia. However, the Persians only adopted that government and that religion. They continued to keep their Persian and their Persian culture. Yet they adopted 40% of Arabic vocabulary within their Persian language. This is incredibly interesting because the Persians were one of the few cultures to do so. Many other cultures and languages ultimately succumbed to the Arab conquest and adopted Arabic and adopted a new culture. However, the Persians kept their Persian culture. This background is incredibly important because it is a product of nationalism. And when nationalism was introduced to Iran in the late 19th century, the Persian language purification movement was a product of that nationalism. This presentation will talk about how different Iranian leaders and how Iranian society reacted to the Persian purification movement or hoped to use the purification movement to spread their ideals or for Iranian leaders to strengthen their power. I will argue that Iranian leaders, although they may have approached the language purification movement differently or spread it throughout the country differently, they all continued to use it in order to strengthen their power amongst the country. Iranian nationalism appeared in the 19th century as Iran's borders were shrinking and as the Qajar government continued to give concessions to foreign powers. Iran was weakening as a state and because of this, Iranian nationalism occurred amongst the intelligentsia in order to strengthen Iranian pride in hopes of eventually strengthening the country. Now, as the intelligentsia hoped to strengthen Iranian pride, they realized that it was hard to do so because the Persian language was in, when reading the Persian language or when speaking as uh, an academic, the Persian language was not accessible to the common Iranian. So that is where the Persian language purification movement truly began to be seen in society again. The, the intelligentsia realized that they needed to come up with an accessible Persian that every Iranian could use and speak. Now, significant nationalistic feelings did not appear within the Qajar Shahs until the reign of Nasser al-Din Shah from 1848 until 1896. He ordered, in an attempt to glorify the monarchy, the translation of many books and histories that the Europeans had written. This backfired because when he had these translations translated into Persian, the Persians realized that Iran was backwards compared to Europe. And they realized that Europe was far ahead of them. And the translations also showed that Iran, pre-Islamic era, was a glorious country and powerful. And so that stimulated pride within them, but also with the realization that Iran was backwards compared to Europe, the intelligentsia realized that something needed to be done. And also, interestingly, the translations showed that Iranians had Aryan roots, or they argued that Iranians had Aryan roots. Uh, this will come in handy later during the Mohammad Reza Shah period. The last thing that these translations showed was that the idea of Iranian identity could be related to a specific territory and a specific language, Persian. 
With all of this information, many Iranians gathered that the pre-Islamic period of Persia was its glory period. And the Arab conquest and the arrival of Arabs ultimately started its downfall. Iranians thought that they were completely distinct from the Arabs for this reason. And the introduction of the idea that they were related to Aryans helped solidify this belief. No, we, we are not Arabs. We're more closely related to the Europeans. And thus it was easy for them, for many Iranians to blame the Arabs for the downfall, the backwardness of the Iranian state, Iranian nation. This was the background leading up to the Constitutional Revolution. The Constitutional Revolution is really important for the language purification movement because it established free speech within the press. And because of this, uh, in a similar fashion as I stated earlier, the intelligentsia and those writing realized that the Persian language was not accessible to everyday Iranians. And so during the Constitutional Revolution period, as they're uh, beginning to talk about new ideas that they previously weren't allowed to talk about, like democracy, uh, they realized that they needed not only to make their language more accessible in general, but they also were lacking in words to describe these new political ideas that they were spreading. So this is uh, ultimately where the language purification movement really picked up and began to be spread. And thus, when Reza Khan came into power, he, the, he was the first leader, the first Iranian leader to really become interested in the Persian language purification movement. Uh, his nationalism was based on solidifying his power through the military, and through modernization. He came into power in a fragmented country and realized that he needed to unify the Iranians in order to maintain his power so that he wouldn't be overthrown. Because of this, in his eyes, he saw the Persian language purification movement as something that could stimulate Iranian pride and thus stimulate Iranian nationalism and thus make Iran a more unified country and therefore his power would not be threatened. It was with this that Reza Shah created a language academy. Previously, he had, under the Ministry of War, created uh, terms for military technology and vocabulary. And, but amongst that, when, when, his, when the government began to talk about the ways that they could reform the Persian language or purify the Persian language, they began to do so much that when the um, intelligentsia, the intellectuals also began to talk about the language question, it sort of got out of hand. And Reza Shah realized that he needed to create a single unified academy in which to talk about this. And that resulted in the establishment of the Farhangistan, which was essentially an academy used in order to refine the Persian language or purify it. They sought to replace Arabic words with Persian words, and they sought to come up with new words for things that did not exist yet in uh, the, the language, such as when the television is getting introduced, things like that, the computer later on. Um, and so, with that, uh, the Farhangistan began to work and established a lot of new words. However, uh, as most of us will know, in, uh, the, in 1941, Reza Shah abdicated. And with that, the Farhangistan sort of fizzled out and his son took over. So when Mohammad Reza Shah took over, his nationalism was v pretty similar to his father's except rather than focus so much on um, security in the way that his father did, he put more emphasis instead on trying to equate Iran with Europe. And with that, his nationalism was based on glorifying Iran. Rather than just look back on the pre-Islamic period with fondness, 
he attempted to create a line directly through from the pre-Islamic era straight to him. And with that, he sort of attempted to glorify Iran. So he also had a Farhangistan, the second Farhangistan, which he reestablished in 1970. And they also attempted to come up with uh, new words for new ideas. However, he saw the Farhangistan more as a way to impress Europeans or to impress European leaders. And with that, his Farhangistan was never as accomplished as his father. Now, lastly, we have the Islamic era and the, the Islamic revolution era. And with that, it's incredibly interesting because the Iranian, uh, the, the leaders of the Iranian revolution in theory were against nationalism. Nationalism went against a solidified Islamic, um, not, not nation, a solidified Islamic world, people. Uh, so because of that, they could not talk about nationalism and Iranian nationalism because it, it shouldn't have existed in their ideas of Islam. However, with the Iran-Iraq war, they realized that they needed nationalism because Iranians needed to feel that they were different and feel that they were unique and sort of even better than, than the people they were fighting, which were Iraqi Muslims most of whom were Shiites like themselves. So because of that, uh, Iranian nationalism was reintroduced into the, uh, into the Islamic Republic. And they, they saw it more as a, uh, the uh, Iranian identity. And they, they then saw it as, leaders saw it as a unique sort of Islamic identity that paired with the Iranian identity. Uh, for example, it wasn't just Islam. It was revolutionary Islam, which went hand in hand with the ideas of Iranian leaders to export their revolution outside of the state. Uh, and also, they could not talk about the Arabic language as a downfall of Iran because that went against Islam and the uh, Arab conquest resulted in Islam. So they couldn't talk like that, the Iranian leaders. They realized that they could not align themselves against an Arab other like many past Iranian leaders did. Instead, they had to align themselves against a westernized other. And so the third Farhangistan came into being, but now, because it's still in existence, so now the third Farhangistan is focused on getting rid of European influences and Western influences because they ultimately led to Westernization, which ultimately can, threat, can threaten the Iranian state. With that, we can see that although different nationalisms have existed under different Iranian leaders throughout the past 150 years or so, Language purification was a constant product of Iranian nationalism that Iranian leaders could use to their benefit in order to strengthen their power. And so whether it's the Qajars or the, uh, or the Pahlavis or the Islamic Republic now, language purification movement has existed and leaders are still continuously gaining how they'd like to react to that in order to continue to solidify their power. Thank you.